Thank you, thank you. All right, well, welcome again, everybody. Um, and we'll, I'll try to keep it, I say this every time, I'll try to keep it clear and concise. Um, and then please ask questions along the way or at the end, I'll leave some time for that. I do have to have a hard stop at one because I have to take my daughter to the doctors. But other than that, we'll, uh, we'll dive right in. So I'm gonna jump in to my screen. Um, just give you a little bit more screen space here. There we go. So this is us today, September 13th. And for those of you that are at the tail end of the Mallet program, congratulations. You're really, this is really, you know, top of mind for you right now. And for folks that started, uh, you're in course three. So it's going by quickly and it won't be too long before you'll be starting to think of this. Uh, before we really dive in though, I would like us all to take a moment to just acknowledge the land that we are working and living and learning on. Um, I am so blessed to be on the land of the Kasatsan and Lekwungen First Nations ancestors and families. And uh, every day when I'm out in my garden saying our goodbye, our, our morning goodbye song to people that go off in all directions for school and work, it's just so uh, powerful to be able to, in my little space, recognize all that has come before and all who will come after. And so you've all heard me say this many times, but I think that's a real invitation for us in our virtual spaces and digital places to take up that same intention around leaving them better than we have found them and leaving them in a way that encourages collaboration, connection, and people who come after us to say thanks and lift up their hands. So thank you for the work that you do in the places that you work. And thank you for the ability to be in this space together. So I'm going to give a quick overview of these pathways. I'll talk a little bit about some considerations that people go through as they make their decisions, the process of the decision and, and how do you actually do this? What are the logistics? Um, some dates to remember and then some resources and some funding resources for you. So you'll be able to you know, do some legwork on that if that's something that's <clears throat> So this is that program at a glance. <laughs> I like how it sort of fades into the you know lovely peachy orange on the bottom right. Um, so we, depending on where you are in your program, you'll see the different courses here that you're you know, topping into. And then you'll see the three pathways at the bottom, the thesis, the applied research project, and the digital learning consulting project. Each one of them has an application process. And so we're gonna talk about that today. Um, you will all in the Mallet program always get into the applied research project pathway. And most people, that's the pathway they choose, actually. We generally have in each year, oh, a hummingbird has come to visit. There we go. Sorry, easily distracted. Um, in each year, we generally have maybe three applications to thesis. So we usually have, you know, maybe one or two students in the thesis route. Uh, we would have approximately the same to the consulting project pathway, just depending on whether that's of interest to people and whether it lines up with their work environment. And then the majority in the applied research project path. So you can kind of get a sense of all of the courses that come before and then those three branches. Each of those branches will do an advanced research course to kickstart it. So for some of you who are thinking about further graduate work, really you're doing um, whatever pathway you choose. The thesis, you're doing 15 credits of research plus your additional early research course. So um, the intro one with Lonnie, so that's 18 credits worth. For the other two, you're doing your research pathway, applied research project or consulting is a six credit course, but your advanced research course is a three. So you're looking at sort of a nine credits worth of graduate research work. For some people, depending on where you wanna go next or funding you'd like to tap into, that's an important um, thing to consider. So all of them, as I mentioned, have a type of advanced research course. For the thesis, you will apply. The application deadline is gonna be coming up shortly. It's in November. 
um, and that's tied to some funding opportunities we'd like to make sure you have the opportunity to dive into if you'd like. So you'll apply and we'll talk about the application. If you are accepted, it's adjudicated by committee. If you're accepted to the thesis pathway, then you'll go on to do your advanced research course, which is really the development of your thesis proposal. It will change in all of these, this will change. I think the biggest thing I would want you to take away from the session is that what you apply for and get accepted into, that idea will morph and change and refine itself as you, even before you start the advanced research course, as you're in the advanced research course, and then as you start doing the work of whatever completion pathway you've chosen. So you do not have to have it nailed down right at the beginning. Um, and then there are some who have over time, you know, as if you've applied, for example, to the research project, you're going to be applying in January, but you won't be starting that work till the following January. A year is a lot of time. So your thinking may have changed. You still might be curious about the, the issue you put in in your application, but you want to take a different slice of it. And that's absolutely fine. The advanced research courses are where you start to really nail it down. And then moving into those final courses, the thesis, the applied research project, or the digital learning consulting project, that's when you're working with either your supervisor or your supporting instructor to get their feedback, refine it even further. And then finally, there's a, a point in the timeline of all of those where you have to call it, make this, this is what I'm doing, and then start the doing. So for thesis, the first research course you've all done, which is wonderful. The advanced research course, you're gonna be really diving in in the thesis to almost the frame of the first three chapters. So you're gonna be diving in to refining your research question, building out your theoretical framework that supports it, using that to then figure out what method you're gonna use in your thesis and explaining all of that and getting this ready to for someone to look at it and say, ah, okay, I understand what you're going to do. The thesis is primary research. You're gonna go out and you're gonna collect data from real people. And so you do have to go through ethics approval. There's an ethics approval uh, research ethic boards at Royal Roads. So you'll submit to there. Depending on the site that you want to do your thesis research in, you may also have to do ethics approval with them as well. So often we see that in K-12 settings. If you're going into a school, they have their own ethics process. Sometimes they'll allow you to submit in parallel, first to the university um, and at the same time to them. Other times they wait until the university has signed off and then you can submit theirs. That's a timing issue. So we'll get to that, but you can see how it quite quickly, the research ethics process could take quite a bit of time. The other place that I've seen it is in Ontario. Um, if you're trying to look across multiple colleges, because you have to go through a centralized process for that, uh, which means you have to get sign off. So it's not insurmountable. We've had a Mallet student do that. Um, he was collecting data from all the colleges in Ontario and then doing his work around that. It just does take a bit more time. And then coming out of the thesis proposal. So in that course, you're gonna, there's a course instructor, Deb Zorn, she's fabulous. She's the director of our Office of Research at Royal Roads. She sees every faculty research proposal for every grant that is submitted. She comments and feedbacks and does all that stuff on them. So you're getting an amazing wealth of knowledge in her. Um, and so she will give you feedback and you know, as it's set up as a course, so there's grades associated with it. Uh, it is also that uh, go, no go point. So if the proposal is not ready, then you will not be able to go on to work with your thesis supervisor. You will have to take the course again. Knock on wood, we have never had that happen, but I do have to say the obvious. You will also be reviewing each other's proposal development in that course. So you'll have Deb's eyes on it. You'll have your eyes on it, a peer review eye on it. And then when you start your thesis course and you're working with your supervisor, the first thing you'll do is send them your proposal and they'll look at it and give you feedback and you'll have to edit and revise it. And then you'll talk with your supervisor and say, hmm, who should we have a second committee member? And you'll bounce around some names. You'll find one that works, that's able to do it. 
And then they get to look at your proposal and give feedback and comment. So this document is living. It is definitely editing, revising. And then when you'll get to a point where your second committee, your thesis supervisor and yourself, you're happy with it, it's done. And that's when you get that sign off. In parallel, you're working on your ethics, but when you get that sign off and then you get your ethics approved, then you can start the work. So there's a, a fair amount of front end work like any good project um, in the thesis before you can really get into, okay, I wanna interview my 20 people or whatever it is. In the applied research project, um, you are doing the first course, everyone does. In your advanced research course, you're framing out your proposal for the applied research project. The applied research project already has some bounds to it. You're not out there doing anything and everything you're doing a metasynthesis of the literature and you're looking at a small subset up to three individuals which represents a small case sample uh, around your research question so you are collecting primary data from up to three people sometimes it's only one sometimes it's three around your research question so you end up getting this metasynthesis of the literature around the question you're really curious about a little bit of intel from your setting, your sponsoring organization. And together, you're able to weave that together to make some recommendations, which is what happens in your applied research project. Um, so the, the advanced research proposal course, that's where you're developing what you think you're gonna do. And again, similar to the thesis structure, you'll get feedback from the course instructor and peers. And then in the applied research project, you're not working one-on-one -on -one with a thesis supervisor, you're working in pods. So depending upon the number, there might be six of you and one um, academic facilitator, there might be eight of you, there might be 10, and you'll be getting feedback from that academic lead there. Um, I'm not sure, it might be me this year around. Uh, it might be Dr. Axe, who's done it for many years. So you'll be getting, you'll be working in a group with some peer feedback, as well as feedback from the instructor. In the applied research project, there's already ethics taken care of. So we've done what's called a blanket course ethics application. And as long as what you want to do falls in that criteria, which is in the course, then you don't have to do anything else unless your site asks you to. So sometimes in K-12, to uh, usually, they may also need something more than just the ethics stamp from Royal Roads. So we can factor that in. What does the blanket ethics allow you to do? It allows you to talk to up to three individuals because this is an applied research project. It's half the number of credits, half the number of credit hours, right? So it's a six credit, not a 12 like the thesis, which roughly means about 200 hours level of effort versus the 400 for a thesis. Of course, I say those numbers, don't hold me to it. It always, people always spend more. But that's when you do the mathematics in terms of how the programs are approved by the province, that's the equation that they use. So this approach and why most people choose it, it's great for when you want to investigate something and you're at the beginning, right? So perhaps, um, perhaps your institution is moving to incorporate virtual reality in some of their apprenticeship training. And they're not really sure, they've done a little dabbling around the edges, but nothing in a formal sort of research documented way. You can take that on and you can do a deep dive into the literature, see what's happening around VR in post-secondary apprenticeship training, and then talk to up to three people in your situation. So maybe your department chair, maybe a faculty member, maybe a student, and, and get their thoughts on it. And then together you weave that information together, you do your data analysis, and come up with some codes and themes that inform your recommendations of what your organization should do. So that brings me to the sponsor. There's a sponsor that is required for your project. Most people, it's where they're working, the organization they're working, but it doesn't have to be. Often people have used this as a way if they're trying to you know, move into a different area or different field or with a different employer, They've offered this as, hey, I have to do this as part of my graduate work. Would you be interested in sponsoring me? What is the role of the sponsor? <laughs> so here, the role of the sponsor is fairly minimal in the sense that they will say yes, 
they'll sign the sponsor agreement, which basically confirms that they're not going to, um, I was going to say overextend you, but um, basically that they understand that this is your graduate degree. It's not theirs. And you have requirements in order to graduate. And so they can't, um, we, we try to protect you, right? So that they can't use you in a way that delays your project or delays you graduating. Um, and so I'll show you in the handbook where those sponsor agreements are. But generally what they're, you're going to do is talk to them about it. Most people get sort of that internal approval. So for example, one of our students who worked in oil and gas, his company was looking at uh, just-in-time video footage uh, from employee generated. And so he approached his manager and said, look, I'd like to research this as part of my master's. What do you think? That sounds great. Signed a sponsor agreement. He took a look, the manager took a look at the research question and sort of the focus and gave some thoughts and feedback. And then open doors if he needed to, to connect to three individuals. And then after that, um, his only other obligation, in that case, it was a gentleman, was to read the final document. The sponsor does not assess this. There's no grading associated to it. For the sponsor, it's just more of, hey, you know, did this work in your organization? And here's what came of it. And many people have used it to then leverage those recommendations into tactical plans for how to move this forward. Um, other people have leveraged it into completely new jobs and consulting contracts. Um, and others have just, you know, it's been something that they've been able to dig into because of their own interest. Why I'm going on and on about the sponsor is it's worth thinking about, hmm, who could be my sponsor? and sort of getting a read of where your organization is at, or if you want to do it external to your organization. Our Center for Teaching and Learning is always interested in being a sponsor because it helps our instructional designers stay fresh on what's happening across all kinds of sectors. sectors. So that's always a possibility as well, as is a Center for Teaching and Learning at any other post-secondary across the country. So there's an opportunity to make some um, network some connections there. Finding the sponsor is something that you are expected to do. So it's something we can, you know, if you have some questions or you wanna run it by me and say, oh, I wonder if, happy to talk about it. Um, but making those connections are something that falls to you. The consulting project. So everything I just said, very similar, except a few things. The consulting project, application is adjudicated by a committee. So people that do apply, it doesn't mean you will automatically be able to do this work. And I'll talk a little bit more about the criteria and why some of the applications would not be a fit just in a bit. Um, this is a great pathway if there's something that you are actually doing in your work right now that you need to dive in and do the research on. Um, and create a product. You still have to write it up academically. So in some ways, it, it actually is quite a bit of work because you're creating something, you're doing the literature search and the meta-analysis synthesis to inform what you create, and then you're writing up your rationale for why you created what you created and what are the next steps. So an example, and it's one of the, in the virtual symposium, there's lots of these, but Tanya's come to, came to mind today so she really wanted to look at how she could um, improve the feedback in real time in the culinary arts in the lab setting because she wasn't getting any time with students. And so she worked with her IT group to, to modify their learning management system to allow her to take short video footage, upload it, quickly make her comments, flag it for the student to go in and make their comments. The student could then submit a new video of their second try at something, and they could have much more of a dialogue than they'd had ever before when she stood beside them for 30 seconds. Um, so that's an example of, of how one student took it up. I really would encourage you on the virtual symposium, go take a look at the Padlets over the past two, three years, and just see all the different projects that people have been dabbling in and, and sort of which pathway they took. In the digital consulting project, the sponsor's involvement is a little more, um, there's a little more arm lifting there for them. So you're gonna be working with your sponsor to really refine 
what it is. So you want to research this, your sponsor needs this. And so you're consulting, right? It's, it's more of a, okay, let's, let's work together on this to consult and see how we're going to take this forward. Um, the sponsor I have found in the past students that have gone this pathway, the sponsor's more involved in opening the doors. So initial emails out to people that perhaps the, the student wouldn't be able to sort of email directly um, to encourage them to participate. In this one, there's a blanket course ethics as well for up to 10 people. So people in the past have done small focus groups, you know, three groups of three, uh, representation across whatever, you know, your participant spectrum would be. And sometimes they've done interviews instead of focus groups. They've done an interview out to 10 people. So you are getting the data from the literature. You're getting the information for up to 10 people from your context. And all of that is informing the thing that you're going to create. It doesn't always have to be um, a tangible thing. Uh, people, so I gave the example of Tanya. Some people have created an entire policy framework document um, because that's what was needed in their setting. Others have built um, one of the, well, Joyce's was lovely. She was a dental hygienist. And so she built this entire online training module for new dental hygienists who were working at the college. Um, and this was very new for her setting to have an online module for this. And then, of course, she was working on it just before the pandemic started. So it was perfect timing <laughs> for her. And the sponsor was very involved and very interested um, as it got closer to the end. Of course, there's no fee. You're not getting paid uh, to do the consulting project. The, the word consulting in the title really is to, to make explicit that this is a consultation as opposed to the applied research project where you're diving in and, and doing your thing. So deep breath, timelines. Uh, for folks that started in 2022, um, the thesis, the application will be in November and you'll hear back uh, very quickly if you're accepted into the pathway. Well, hopefully very quickly, usually by de before December 1st. And then you have, so you have that, and then you have all this lovely time to wait till next summer where you'll do LRNT 600, which is the advanced research uh, proposal course for thesis. And then coming out of the successful completion of that by end August, early September, you're starting into your thesis work with your supervisor. The way we tend to approach the supervision is people that are successful in the thesis um, the thesis coordinator meets with all of the faculty in the School of Education and Technology, and we adjudicate and look at those files to see, okay, who, who's a good fit for your research area? Who's a good fit for your research area? How could we support these students? What's your availability to take on more students? If we can't find a thesis supervisor in that first pass, then we go to the Royal Roads faculty writ large, so 70 plus faculty members, and we talk to the faculty and see if we can find a match for a thesis supervisor. On the very, very rare occasion that that doesn't happen, then we would consider an external thesis supervisor. But the preference is, and, and by and large, it generally um, has been that your thesis supervisor is from Royal Roads and ideally from the School of Education and Technology. And that's great because their role is really a process role. Um, and then if they have that content expertise in a particular area that you're exploring, that's even better. So I won't go into the weeds on this because it's laid out in the thesis handbook, but I just wanted to highlight the timeline in sort of a big chunk view. So you're accepted into the thesis pathway early December this year. You don't, you'll find out who your thesis supervisor is, but you don't really contact them. Then next summer, you'll do your research proposal course, and then you'll start to make some connection with your thesis supervisor. Next fall, you'll give them your proposal, first thing you do in the course, and you'll have that back and forth revisions. Generally, we find by the time the proposal goes back and forth and gets revisions and tightened with thesis supervisor and second committee member, it's usually sort of mid-October. Ethics is happening at the same time. By about mid-November, everything's ready to go which is not great timing to connect, collect data in most places. <laughs> 
So we have had people do some data collection late November, or early December, but by and large, people tend to flag January as the data collection month. Um, ethics can take, within Royal Roads, they say between four and six weeks. I have found it to be quicker, but we, I always tell my students time count on it as four to six weeks before you'll get ethics approval. If you're then having to get ethics approval at the site you're doing the research, that just adds more time. So it becomes something to be aware of. Um, so January, February data collection, initial analysis, sort of February, March, feedback, revision cycles. Um, and so you're looking for basically being able to have everything ready by mid-April. And then that goes out to an external examiner. Once your committee has said, yep, it's ready, it goes out to an external examiner. They give their feedback and review. And then there is an oral examination, an oral defense. And then from there, there are the five decisions accepted, accepted with major revisions, minor revisions, not accepted. Um, this timeline for some stretches, so we perhaps, many of you will have met Patrick. So the way his data collection cycle, he needed more time to collect the data because he was framing it around his semester work. And so he took an extension. What does that mean? It means that depending upon when things get completed, he may not convocate with his cohort. He may not walk across the stage with his cohort because that deadline um, for uh, the list of graduates to go to approval at Academic Council, I think is early September. So there is some wiggle room, you know, in that sort of June, July frame. I find most of our thesis students tend to be doing their oral defense in July. It just seems to be how it all works out. But that's the time frame for that one. I know you guys see, you're like, oh, I thought oh, it's a bit of a whirlwind. Elizabeth keeps talking. <laughs> um, the applied research project for the consulting project. So applications are due mid-January. And then next fall, you'll do your research methods course. Oh, I'm just getting a little background. We might need someone to turn off their mic. I'll just get you guys to take a look, make sure your mics are off. Ooh. Um, after you've successfully completed that advanced research course, then you're gonna get started, right? And 691 is the applied research project, 692 is the consulting project. So they'll start, for folks that started this year, that'll be mid-January for you. And you'll be doing all of that good work and get your draft paper in, the first version of the full draft by mid-March. You'll get feedback by mid, you know, do the peer feedback cycle and revisions by mid-April. You'll present at the virtual symposium. And then mid-May, you're submitting your final report. And then there's peer assessment early June. So the course wraps up early June. So that time frame alone should help you see that the scope of this needs to go from here to here because you're working within, and, and it's the first thing that you'll do in your research course. It's the first thing you'll hear when you work with the, the academic leads in these courses is, okay, this is awesome. And how can we scope it down? Think of it as phase one of the work you want to do, um, because otherwise the timeline becomes really challenging and the work becomes much more than what's required of this six credit course. All right, so considerations. And I'll try not to repeat a million things here. Um, 12 credits, primary research for the thesis. It is individual work. You do require ethics. Um, some people have talked about, I mean, it, well, they know, I know there's less exposure to courses because you're not taking two of the other courses that the other folks would. Um, so you don't get to meet as many faculty, work with different faculty, and you're not working with your cohort or team at that point. So you're basically stepping out and working on your own on your research. The product has a bit more depth because of the hours you've spent at it. That's not any question of ability. It's just a mathematical piece. Um, 
there's a lot of mays on the right-hand side. It may have additional academic publishing opportunities, may have improved chance for funding, and may have improved chance for further um, graduate work. That landscape is changing. It's been changing over the past 10 plus years. So there are lots of academic journals now that publish graduate work. If you want to get your work published, whether it's a thesis or not, there are lots that publish it. Um, you may have to refine and work and, and contain it differently, but if that's one of your goals, there are avenues to do that. Um, funding, it depends. For some employers, um, the funding is in a piece of, the thesis is a piece of the funding, so um, you'll need to figure that piece out. Improved chance of further work. Um, I think historically, perhaps, this would have been the case, but now increasingly what we're seeing is it's not just that. Um, when you're applying to doctoral programs or EDD programs, people want to see record of publication. They want to see conference presentations. They want to see the work that you've been doing in a research agenda. They want to see that you're committed to embedding yourself in this research space. So that I think is why there's, I know that's why I put the maze there. Um, it is published work. It will be out in the public domain. It will be published as a document, a, a, dis, a thesis. And so like the ones that you search and pearl dive for the references, it'll be there. And then a student had flagged this for me. And I, so I put it up because I think it is fair, uh, potentially a greater chance of connecting with the communities because you're diving deep into one area and you're really getting to know the names and the writers and the way they're thinking and the way their research is going and what that means, how it's been played out and used. So I put potentially because I think anyone at any point could choose to dive in to a community. You don't need a thesis to motivate you to do it, but the thesis can be a vehicle where you really do um, connect perhaps more deeply. I put a couple of links there for you. Um, a thesis student explaining the value and then the links to the different presentations. So you can just get a sense of what people have been doing. For the applied research project, you're taking more courses. So you get to expose to more faculty, more course topics. Um, you are not spending as much time because it's six credits, not 12. You are talking to people and doing primary research, but only on up to three people. And the document is not considered published unless you choose to make it public on your blog. It's not something that will be indexed or found in a library database. You, however, can choose, and I really encourage people to do this, and we've had several who've done it, uh, you can choose to publish it to a journal afterwards and submit it to a workplace journal, submit it to an academic journal, and we've had the gamut over the years in Mallet. So um, that's always an option. And I really encourage it because these projects are amazing. The work that people do is phenomenal and their findings are so useful for others who are interested in that area that it's a shame to just have it sit, you know, in a course shell, right? It, it needs to be shared. Um, some employers can see this route as the more practical route. So that's something to keep in mind. And then the considerations on the right-hand side. One thing I did want to mention, I think you've heard me say it before, but with this in particular, I mean, with all of the completion pathways, as you're working through your courses and you're finding that you're really becoming curious about A or B or an area, use that, right? Use an assignment in your course to dive into an aspect of something that you're curious about to get your head in the readings, to get used to what people are saying in that space to figure out if you actually do want to spend six credits and 200 plus hours looking into that. So use the courses along the way in your earlier coursework to start really exploring some of the things that you might like to do in your completion pathway. Um, the last point, because it does come up for people, this less so now because, because there is data collection in here, albeit it's a small sample case of up to three, there, you can say that you have had experience with primary data collection, with data analysis. So it's been, you have to, of course, limit it to up to three, but you've gone through, you, you're familiar with the techniques. You will be by the time you're done. So some universities, if you're going on to do additional work, um, they're looking for perhaps a more robust 
you know, in the past that were looking for additional courses that you would take to demonstrate that you knew how to do research. And this one with its data collection piece and analysis, you can say, yeah, I, this is an example of what I've done with respect to research. And of course there's tons more to learn, but I have actually done primary research and collected data. The consulting project, um, many, of the th many of what you're seeing on the benefits are similar to on the other slide, the same as with the considerations. I think where people who've gone through this pathway really see the distinction is in that ability to, this is gonna sound funny, but to take it to market. They're not taking it to market, but to actually get in in their organization with a project that's just starting or needs the research component to it, to inform it, and really makes a meaningful change in their organization by the creation of something, whatever the thing is. So I think that's where you would see a lot of the differentiation. And then I put in all of here, I put the links for you so you can go and look at what everyone has done. So thesis application. All the applications are on the Mallet program page. If you go over to toolkit and go down to documents, then you'll see all of the application forms are there. All the handbooks are there um, and take time. I mean, that's if I would say one thing, that's the first place to start. Go to the one that you think you're interested in read the handbook and get a better sense of what this really is going to entail. And then go to some of the Padlets and see what people had in the past have done. So the thesis is November 7th, the Applied Research Project and the Digital Learning Consulting Project is January 23rd as a deadline. And the application forms are two pages maximum. Um, for the thesis, they're all fairly similar. The thesis I'll focus on here because this was created based on what some of the granting agencies require in their application. The idea being that if you are thinking of thesis and you're also thinking of applying to some of the grants I'm going to highlight for you, you won't have to do a lot of rework and you'll get feedback from the adjudication committee on your thesis application, which can then inform your revisions to your grant application. So you're talking a bit about yourself, academic background, work experience, a little bit about your proposed research, really digging into, you know, what do you want to research and why? Why is this important? What is the value? And how is it going to contribute to the advancement of knowledge? Then you'll get into some of your research objectives and a draft research question. Now, I know you went with Lonnie <laughs> into the research question vortex and explored all of that. Um, I also appreciate that when you're submitting this, it's you're just starting course four in the program. So the adjudication committee understands that. They're not expecting that research question to be absolutely airtight. They are expecting you to not have done it at the 11th hour. They're expecting you to have actually thought about your research question, edited it, revised it, bounced it off a few people, you know, massaged it a little. So I think that would be, and I hear it from lots of students, <laughs> Don't rush this application process. F start filling out the easy stuff for sure. And then let it sit, R write your research question, write your objectives, bounce it off somebody, get some feedback, edit and revise those. Think about your initial, initial methodology. How, what are you gonna do with how many people? Um, why would you choose that if this is your research question, right? Try to make those connections really explicit. And you'll want to do, and part of the application is just a cursory review of the literature, just to demonstrate that, yeah, I've, I've had my head in this space a little bit. It's really informing my thinking around the question and what I want to pursue. Um, scope is always an important thing in any of these applications. Get it all out there, get all that edit and revision, look at it again, and then have someone sit with you and say, uh-huh, really, really, Elizabeth, how are you going to do this in six months? Really, really, who do you have to talk to? How are you gonna line that up? Will they answer their email in time? What else is happening in your sponsoring organization, right? So taking that very um, attempt to be really objective view of just the timing can also be a great way to help you tighten your, your application. This is what the adjudication committee, and it changes, but this is what they've looked like over the years. The committee changes, not what they're looking for. <laughs> uh, 
they're looking for these research questions that are well crafted that, that, that there's been some thought to them. Um, a connection between that literature review and the question itself, and then an alignment between the method you're thinking of using and the question itself. Clear and concise writing, the manageable scope piece, and then this is a piece that um, I think we often go back and forth on when I get the decision from the committee and I'm talking to students, is that goodness of fit. So when you look at the three completion pathways and you look at what you want to do, is the thesis the right fit for it? Or could you achieve this um, perhaps in a more fulsome way with the applied research project? Because what you want to do actually is something that's just starting or just at the very beginning. Um, as I mentioned, we do try to make the decisions and get this back to you very quickly because of the funding. So there's three different funding sources to take a look at. There's a BC Graduate Scholarship, and its deadline usually is December 1st. This year it's January, January 6th, which is great. So worth taking a look at. Um, we've had Mallet students be successful in the past. It's a merit-based and there, so each university is allocated a certain number of fees. So it's definitely worth contacting financial aid. There are, in this one, I believe, there are some particularities around how many courses you've taken, blah, blah, blah. So contact financial aid if you're at all interested because very quickly they can tell you, yep, totally worth your time applying, absolutely. Or yeah, no, don't bother <laughs> because one of the criteria isn't met and it, you know, it's not gonna be something that you can change. So really uh, would encourage you if you're interested and because of its focus, this isn't just for thesis, because of its focus, this can work for applied research project and the consulting project completion pathway. So worth taking a look. Um, I do believe it's still, I, I didn't have time to check before I came on, but I believe it still does require you to complete the Canadian Common CV, which takes longer than you think it will, because it um, it's a as it says, Canadian Common, it's a federal government platform. Um, and so it just does take quite a bit of time to complete. So that, give yourself some time there. There's also the Shirk Canada Graduate Scholarship. Um, it's 17,500 for 12 months, non-renewable. And this is really, oh, sorry, I left that sentence off. This is really around um, supporting students to develop their research skills. So we have, one or two thesis students now that were able to be successful in this scholarship. And its deadline is December 1st this year. So that's why we try to get our feedback to the thesis students in particular quickly so that you can edit and use that info. Um, where it says for more details, see the, <laughs> it's, it's what underneath December 1st. The, they have a great blog on how to fill out this application form, what it's all about and how to really craft it so that you can be as strong of an applicant as possible. And they're just super helpful. So don't hesitate to connect with them. And then the last one are the in-course awards. And so these are quarterly application deadlines. Um, and this is how you jump in there. In your My Admin, you can jump into My Awards and then see if there are any that are particular. Um, sometimes we've had, I'm thinking of one student a few years ago who was successful, partly because of the area that they wanted to research and what their work was, um, connected them sort of out of the broader scope of education. Because uh, sometimes when you look at these, I haven't looked at them in a while myself, but um, sometimes they're really not focused on education. They might be more focused on ed environment or something like that. So I think we've been through here on the, the deadlines and who reviews this, um, you will get, so with this one, uh, part of my role is to provide you with some high level feedback on your application because then you can use it to think about it as you continue to go forward in the program, as you continue to go forward with your courses. So you'll get feedback from me um, and you'll get a note saying, hey, great, thank you. That, this whole process actually came from students um, before people were just put in this course. It was the default. But what students said was, no, we, we need to start thinking about this sooner than right before we do the course of applied research project. So can we have an application form? The application is 
the wrong word because I think it gets people really concerned about whether or not they're, they're going to get in. Um, so let me just dis dispel that concern. For the Applied Research Project, spend that time on your application and I will give you some feedback on where I think you can refine it, what you might want to think about in the upcoming courses as you, you know, knowing now where you want to go, you know, here are some ideas. So you'll get some formative feedback from me um, that hopefully you find useful as you continue to think about what that applied research project will be for you. The consulting project application is adjudicated by committee. Um, if you're not successful, then you will be placed in the applied research project pathway completion. And you and I will have a conversation on how to take what you thought you were gonna do in the consulting project and work with the confines of the applied research project, you know, sort of those bounds to still address your research question. And many of these things are similar to what you saw in the thesis. I think in that application form and certainly hearing from the committee, what I often hear back from them is great project isn't a consulting project it actually is a better fit for applied research project. So really take, if this is a path you're thinking of, really take some time to dive into the consulting project handbook, take a look at what others have done so you can see the distinction between that and applied research project. Um, and then the other piece here I would say is, this is one of the ones where the scope can just balloon. And so really trying hard to keep that scope tight, use that, you know, 200, roughly 200 hours, roughly six credit, I mean, it is six credits, roughly 200 hours, just really to try to keep that as tight as possible in your application. So I know you thought I would never stop. <laughs> uh, Marlene, oh, I think Yvonne actually, because Marlene's away after this week, because Doug, who's the thesis coordinator for the school, um, I was able to pass the torch to him after doing it and he very graciously took it on. So he's doing a presentation this week as well um, on the thesis process. And so he'll dive into the weeds in more detail. And after that, Marlene through Yvonne will send out an email that basically gives you all the deadlines, the links to applying for the financial awards if you're interested and map it out for you. So she'll send that out. The, she'll then send a reminder, usually third week of October, about the deadline for thesis, November 7th. And that's when we get a lot of panic from people. Oh my gosh, do I have to do it? I don't know, I don't wanna do it. I don't know, I haven't thought of it. I thought it was a good idea in September, but I haven't thought of it since, and I don't know if I have time. So all of that to say, <laughs> uh, take some time to think about it. And also please remember, you don't have to do thesis. I think we have a myth that a master's degree is not valid or valued unless you did a thesis exit. And that is a myth. Um, there is so much value and worth and practical use in the applied research projects and the digital consulting projects. Um, and just knowing some student stories of where their projects have taken them, it's, you know, it's just, wide open. So maybe just, you know, if, if that's something that you're feeling and you want to talk about it a bit more with me, feel free to reach out and we can, we can talk more, but just know that it, you do not have to do a thesis to complete your master's. There are multiple ways to do a master's degree and they're all valid and they're all valuable by the research community and by the, the practical implementation part. I mentioned the handbooks and where you can find them and a bunch of resources here. Um, it is worth, if you are thinking of thesis, it's worth taking a look at some of the Mallet thesis already because that'll give you a great idea of what you're in for in terms of the size of the document, uh, the scope of the work, um, timelines, that sort of thing. And then there are all these different symposiums here. And these are some of the more dated ones. And I put the newer ones in the slide deck sooner so you can have them and take a look. And then these are some other ones that you might find useful. Um, that first one is a really fabulous publication. It's thin and it's actually, you know, it, okay. I think it's interesting. Maybe it's not riveting, but, um, but it is interesting. It talks about, you know, argumentation and the formation of an argument and creating 
you know, the, the writing support in this work at this level. Um, in the Royal Roads Library, the Sage Handbook of Online Research Methods is fantastic. And there's a ton in the Royal Roads Library around research methods from Sage that cover all aspects of the research process. So it's a really big resource that lots of students, some never find, um, but lots of students don't take a look at. So it's worth dipping into. The Punch book, uh, Developing Effective Research Proposals, it's useful. It's very easy to read, walks you through how to develop a research proposal, things that maybe, you, you know, even when I read it, I'm like, oh, right, I should put that in. Um, so worth taking a look at too, and it's, it's thin. And then all of the handbooks can be found on the path. So I think I've mentioned the first two already. I think you've heard me talk about keeping your journal or field notes or a sticky board or bubblegum wrappers. I don't know, something where you have these curiosities, these research questions, these ideas, and then keep reading, read, read, read research because it, it helps with your writing. It helps with your critical eye. It helps you really start to see, oh, they could have done that, but they did this. I wonder why, right? So it helps you see that. I'm going to, stop this sharing so I can see the chat and see all of you. And Michael, yes, the slides will be uploaded. Um, Marlene usually puts them up on the school YouTube channel, I think, but I'll, I can also put them up in, where can I put them? The link, I suppose I can put them there. Um, but yeah, they'll be, and they'll be sent out as well. Corey, thank you for that about the NSERC scholarship and civil servants are not eligible. That's really useful information for everybody. And Marion, I'm sorry I missed that. Uh, what couple slides would you like me to go back to? <laughs> you may have stepped away, that's okay. So uh, how is the whirlwind? How are we feeling right now about options? If you're feeling a little overwhelmed, it's okay. <laughs> it's a lot of information. Um, I think that uh, just know that the handbooks are there and taking time to go through them will really help. Um, it will, <laughs> I think I'll need to watch this again. Oh no. <laughs> um, and then I think really what I hear from students who've done it in the past is just focus on what you're curious about. What do you wanna know? If you can give yourself this gift of being able to research something, what do you want to know? What do you what do you want to find out? And and from whom, right? Because that also helps distinguish maybe what completion pathway you'll take. Because you you don't often get to be under the I think of the Harry Potter cloak of invisibility. You don't often get to be under that crowd of the the cloak of the master student who's like, hey, I, I'd love to research this and I'd love to share it back with you. And I'm really interested. And I have, you know, I have this course I have to complete and I'm also really interested and I can tap into the library and all the journal articles. And that's a pretty special and privileged place to come from. So yeah, take, take some time to think about what is it that I wanna use that power for and, uh, and explore. Julia, go ahead, please. Cut me off. <laughs> Give me the hook. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to ask about the sponsors. Like, I don't know if qualified is the word, but like what makes a sponsor, like in my case, I teach at a college. Would, you know, another coworker that's working in the same field as well, or uh, like a program coordinator, or are we going as high as like associate dean? Like, what would be. Great question. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I totally know what you're saying. Um, and it, you're not gonna like my answer maybe. It does kind of depend on your research. Um, if you think you need the associate dean title to sponsor you in order to get access to the people that you wanna talk to, then they probably need to be your sponsor. If, if what you wanna research and the people that you wanna involve in your research, even as the applied research project, we're only doing three, but you still, need the involvement and it can be up to one it can also just be one person so you know that um then maybe your coworker or maybe your department chair so we've had any and all um in the handbook 
we try, so, you know, if it isn't helpful, please tell us, but we try to lay out like, what are the criteria for a good sponsor and what should you be looking for? And then when the sponsor signs the letter of agreement, they're committing to being that role for you. And so we try to make that part fairly clear. Thanks, Alicia. See you. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Nicole? Yeah, um, there was a slide there that said call to action for thesis applications. Now I have a one that's printed off a document. Is that not the actual application? Or would you just change that document into two page, two pages? Or, or is there a, another application coming? No, there is not another application. It's, it's what is up on the program page. So let me just grab it, make sure that we're. So all... it's a, it's a doc. Yeah, I got a document with a bunch of questions on the one page. Yeah. So we would expand that, keep the questions, yes. reformat it. So it's a two page document. Yeah, yeah I, sorry. I, I understand your question now, I think better. Um, yes, so maximum two pages, right? So those are all the questions on that application. And as you fill them in, your, this isn't a seven page application you're sending back. It's maximum of two, um, which then gives you a sense. And I think I can't I'll have to look at that application, but I think it um, does give you a sense of sort of word count for each area, um, just to give you some guidelines. Where do you want to spend your emphasis when you're doing the application? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Michael? Uh, yeah, I'll just be quick here. Uh, uh, the, 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 for the ARP, the three, um people you I guess are are they research subjects or are they industry experts or can they be either or or great because question. it's only three people yeah, so. yeah it's a great question so in the context of doing your applied research project they're going to be your research participants and you're going to send them a letter to invite them to participate in the research don't worry that's all under course blanket ethics it's already created you're going to send them a letter to invite them to participate you're going to give them the guidelines and then you'll either survey them or interview them or focus group them um, but they can be industry experts, right? So they could be people in your field. So it's also, and we've had a few students use this. It's also a great way. Like if, if there's someone that is absolutely critical to supporting what you need to do at your institution, right? That you really, I mean, you'd never be able to get them to guest speak. They cost a fortune. You can't fly them in to consult for five days. No one could afford that. But if you want to tap into their expertise, then invite them to be part of your research study. Invite them to be a research participant and have a half hour conversation with them or an hour conversation with them. And then that's your data that you're then going to analyze and theme. So you have to develop, you know, very focused research questions and that'll be all part of, you know, as you develop your methodology. But it is a, a way that you can tap into some of that knowledge from industry experts. And I'll just, I will reinforce for some people, it's extremely hard to get anybody. And so one is fine. It's up to three. So we're not trying to make this, you know, it's great if you can have three because then you have, you know, three legs of the stool and you can do a little analysis. If you have one, that's okay. You can still analyze a transcript from one interview or a narrative survey data um, from one person. That's fine. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I guess we'll figure out the nitty gritties later in upcoming courses. I'm gadget. I'm gathering. But yeah. I won't stress about it now. <laughs> <laughs> well, take some time. Take a look at the handbook. I think um, that's a great place to start because it does go through. Uh, you know, in the back end of it, it goes through what should be in your introduction section. How many pages should it be? What should be in your lit review? What should be in your methods? What should be in your findings? So it it lays it all out, and I think. Um, it's like all good things, right? The mountain seems huge, but then when you look at the steps and just focus on, okay, let's do this piece, and then we'll move to that piece. It's, it becomes much more manageable. And there are a whole bunch of people who went before you in this master's degree that never ever thought they would be researchers, never ever in a million years thought they would publish in a journal or present in an academic conference or get their research read by someone else other than, you know, their significant other uh, and their supervisor. <laughs> so you can do this. And, and I think what people find at the end is that, I mean, there's definitely peaks and valleys in the journey, but 
they're really proud of themselves as they should be and really amazed with what comes out at the other end of it. So I'm excited for you. I'm excited to, to see which path you'll take and then to support you as we can, as you, as you go down that path. If this feels still like a lot and I have no idea where I'm going or anything, like, <laughs> am I behind? <laughs> because yeah. I feel like this is no. during this entire project. I'm like, okay, I have an idea of like my focus and everything, but I have no idea how, like where to go from here. So once I go through that full package, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and you are, you're, Julia, thank you for that question. Cause it's, it's what many people feel and you're not behind. I mean, you're at the, some people, even up to their very last course, aren't sure what they want to do on their applied research project. They put in their application, they got some feedback on that idea. And then of course there's 10 other ideas that come up between that course and when they actually have to start their project. Um, I think what the advantage of knowing sooner, if there's an advantage, is then you can do more reading in advance, right? So you can get more established in, say you're looking at uh, virtual reality in, in post-secondary. You can read more of that literature in advance of then jumping into your research proposal course, because that course is going to get you to write your research question, do your framework, do a, a cursory lit review. And so you're going to, if you're all, if you're doing that and you're still getting up to speed on what the literature is saying, sometimes people can find that that's a lot. And sometimes people find that actually that's just the right time because their work schedule and the way they've structured their work, they can just dive in and, and that's fine. So it's different. The journey is different for everybody. Um, I think what people find helpful along the way is, is to keep track of the ideas that come up and start to look and see if you're seeing themes. Oh, okay. I keep, this keeps coming up for me. I better, I better do something about this. Either dive into it in a course assignment and say, okay, yeah, I did that. That's enough. Or dive into it and say, yeah, I'm, this is, I'm kind of, this is connecting with me. I want to go deeper. And then use your course instructors, bounce ideas off of them. Say, hey, I'm kind of interested in researching this. What, do you know anybody who does that? Or what do you think? Is that a, a research question worth asking? Um, yeah, use them too. Any last questions or wonderings? You know where to find me. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I really, I know, I know many of you have given up an hour of your day to dive your head into research and now are probably like, oh, okay, I need a stretch and uh, coffee. Um, so thank you. Thank you for and, doing that. And to read the rest of that book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, have a great rest of your week. And uh, don't, if you have a question, don't hesitate to reach out and just drop me a note. We can meet and chat about it. I'm going to stop the recording. I think. Thank you, Michael, for reminding me to do that.